Hi, I'm Sarah Gardner. We leave the country behind on this edition of America's Heartland to meet some people who do their farming in the city. We hit the road to Albuquerque, New Mexico, where some residents are getting close to the land with a community effort connecting consumers to their food. We'll take you to Massachusetts, where one farm family keeps the farming tradition alive, even as the city moves closer to their land. If I said New York City, you wouldn't think of farming. But this farm has been in the Big Apple for more than 300 years. And we head to California's capital for some mushroom farming in a very unlikely location. It's all coming up on America's Heartland. America's Heartland is made possible by Crop Life America, representing the companies whose modern farming innovations help America's farmers provide nutritious food for communities around the globe. The Fund for Agriculture Education, a fund created by KVIE to support America's Heartland programming. Contributors include the following. Close to the land. Welcome to America's Heartland. We're spending a little time in the city on the program this time. If you're a regular viewer, you know that we've taken you to farms and ranches all across the country, including Alaska and Hawaii. But we're heading for some urban destinations for a focus on farming that's just a bit different. City farms are nothing new. Early Americans grew their own produce close to home, and many urban residents kept livestock on their property even into the 20th century. The growth in the organic movement has prompted many city and suburban families to try large-scale gardening or search out sustainably grown products at farmers markets close to home. And many cities have created community gardens as part of their recreation, socialization, and urban redevelopment programs. So let's take a look at some different aspects of farming in the city. And let's head for New Mexico to start. That city is helping residents learn more about eating healthy and where their food is coming from. Oh my gosh, here's a perfect one. This is, this is the size we want right here. We're not just growing food, we're growing farmers, and we're growing citizens that are educated and informed about the environment and the connection between food and the environment. Minor Morgan oversees a growing project that has deep roots in his Albuquerque community. Minor runs a nonprofit organization known as the Rio Grande Community Farm. It shows the public how soil and society interconnect by allowing ordinary folks to grow produce on a publicly owned urban farm. We operate a community garden where anybody in the community can take a plot and learn how to grow their own food. We uh, distribute the food to our citizens. We have education programs. It's just, it, it's the perfect combination of social work and farming. People rent out a row. It's $40 a year, it goes January to December. Um, rows are somewhere between 80 to 100 feet long, approximately two to three feet wide. We have weed whacker, tiller, tools, seeds. We get seeds donated, and the garden provides all that stuff along with some workshops. Let me grab this puppy. The farm has operated in collaboration with the city of Albuquerque for some 15 years. It attracts growers of all ages who plant just about everything. From corn, broccoli, and peppers, He's perfect. to okra, tomatoes, and a variety of herbs. The community garden is extremely popular. It's the longest running community garden in the city, and the biggest as well. Um, and the, that community building is also a very unique part of it. The roar of the traffic nearby is a reminder that this is truly an urban farm. But that proximity also allows the growers to easily connect with other nonprofit organizations in the area. We work with one of our local agencies, Adelante, that works with the developmentally disabled. They come out here twice a week. Uh, we work with a program called Meals on Wheels that helps provide food to the elderly. 
we're an AmeriCorps training site. Uh, what that means is we have a cadre of 10 to 15 young folks that want to be farmers, and they come out here and spend a year learning how to farm. Shane Hobson is an AmeriCorps volunteer. While looking ahead to a career as a lawyer, working on the farm has provided some valuable skills. Teamwork has been one of the most important skills that I've learned. Just working with people from all over the country with different backgrounds and working with members of the community as well from all sorts of different backgrounds, different cultural and socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, I've also learned specific farming skills. We've had to weld, we've had to um, you know, build a lot of different things, use a lot of woodworking uh, tools. I've always wanted to learn how to farm and like what goes into a farm, so it's been really nice to learn some of that this summer. How we go, Dan? Looks pretty good, actually. Uh, you know, we chopped this before when it was about this tall. Yeah. And so this is cutting up pretty well. Miner and associate Dan Schuster also use the farm as a teaching tool. Working with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, they review approaches to no and low-till farming. Uh, we're looking at changing our tillage practices. Uh, we've done traditional tillage where we have heavy disc and shanks and plows. Uh, what they're finding is that that kills the first 12 inches of soil, the biological activity. So the USDA now is looking at how do you grow crops by preserving the soil. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they're finding is that if you can keep a, a residue on the surface, uh -huh. that the uh, organisms in the soil come up and actually break down the material, you can see it's a mat on mm -hmm. the surface. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of this residue over a period of a year or two will break down uh, and become nutrients for the soil. Irrigation, especially in dry areas like New Mexico, is another area of focus. We're modeling for farmers uh, how to use water efficiently, using drip system, using surface water in a drip system, using flood irrigation with efficient methods like pipelines and laser levels. Those educational ideals directed at society as a whole are the driving force behind the community farm. As we all know, resources are limited. And the more we can raise a population that understands the importance of conserving resources, the better we're gonna be as a society and as a world. So for me, you know, we're, we're out there saving the world. I mean, what problem do you got? I have an answer for you. Ready for some facts and fun about New Mexico agriculture? The New Mexico State Flower is the blossom of the yucca plant. It's a versatile plant whose leaves can be used to make rope and baskets. And the land of enchantment grows lots of chilies. In fact, New Mexico is a state question, red or green, depending on your chili choice. Sharing knowledge about agriculture doesn't have to involve getting down in the dirt and growing your own food. Take New York City, for example. The urban farming experience there is just a bit different. Now, there are a sizable number of rooftop gardens in the Big Apple, and you'll find community gardens there as well. But let's share one farming destination that's been part of New York City for more than 300 years. Hey, girls. How's it going? You could call them urban farmers, and urban certainly applies in this case. We're our little agricultural oasis here in this urban area. You can see, if you look to the north, you can see North Shore Towers. We were surrounded by a residential neighborhood. That residential neighborhood is in the midst of the country's biggest metropolis. This small piece of the heartland is the Queens County Farm Museum in New York City. But beyond the concept of Big Apple agriculture is the fact that this farm has been part of the New York landscape since the 17th century. It's been farmed since 1697 continuously. Um, it was originally a Dutch farm, uh, part of a 100 acre spread that the Adrians family built the farmhouse in 1772. Um, it was after the Adrians family, it became part of the truck farming era, so it provided in the 19, well, from the turn of the century into the 1920s and early 30s, provided farm fresh vegetables for the city of New York. Since 1975, the now 47-acre spread has been run by the New York City Parks Department, making it available to the public seven days a week. It's a place that you can go and not have to spend a lot of money. It's free. 
It's a great place to come to bring young kids, just, just to, to walk around in a park-like environment. Just be the kohlrabi? Okay, that'll be three dollars, please. The farm also allows city visitors to be locavores, those who enjoy buying locally grown produce. Seasonally, we sell here right on the farm five days a week, June till November. And then all year round, we go to the Union Square Farmer's Market, um, which is in New York City, every Friday. And that's really exciting because we have a faithful customer base there, a lot of regulars who rely on us. This living museum is more than just a historical display of old tractors and even older farm structures. It's a demonstration of what life was like when New York was an agrarian city. And we farm about three acres, just a diversified vegetable operation. And in addition, we have a small livestock operation, including sheep and pigs and goats and, and one cow and chickens. So we really try and grow a diversity of vegetables to show the community what you, know, you can grow and also um, to appeal to a lot of different tastes and preferences. Recently we just released our first vintage of wine. We sell farm fresh eggs, we have hundreds of thousands of honeybees, so we make honey. We have obviously 200,000 school kids who come here each year for education programs. And we have as uh, many, many events, including my favorite, which is the county fair in late uh, September. It's an old style county fair. Because of its location, the farm is also able to offer hands-on opportunities to those who may never be exposed to an agricultural environment. There's so many people that want to come out to the farm. We have so, you know, probably around an average of 10 to 20 volunteers a week throughout the season, um, which is just a great way to meet people in the community and to get people hooked on, hooked on farming and growing. Actually, that's just a green bib lettuce. And for the urban agrarians who work here, it's a bit of city and country life. When I walk in the gate and I'm here on the farm, I, I do not feel like I'm in New York City. It's pretty wild. It's, it's, um, it's uh, as you can see, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a nice escape from the city life. You can just find every, everything you want in the city. I, I can sit here and work, plow the fields during the day, and 25 minutes from now, I could be on a broad, at a Broadway show. Every time I see a kid who's from an urban environment walk up and say, oh my gosh, that's a chicken or a goat. Um, it just, it really gives me a thrill even today. Home to the Farm Museum, the New York Borough of Queens was established in 1683 as one of the 12 original counties of New York. And what about its name? Historians say it was named for Queen Catherine of Braganza, the Portuguese princess who married England's King Charles II. Hi, I'm Paul Robbins, and here's something you may not have known about agriculture. If you were an athlete in ancient Greece, garlic was a part of your training regimen. It was thought that garlic gave you strength and endurance, and Americans like their garlic. We consume a quarter billion, with a B, pounds of garlic every year, and scientists say the garlic is good and good for you. Garlic is one of the world's oldest cultivated plants. It was first grown in Central Asia and worshipped by the Egyptians who fed it to workers building the Great Pyramids. French settlers brought it to America and today garlic is grown in almost every state with California being the leading producer. Garlic has been shown to have antibacterial and antifungal properties as well as being beneficial in preventing coronary disease. And health benefits aside, garlic is very, very popular in many types of cuisine, adding a spicy, fragrant flavor to everything from soups to stews to burritos. Now, garlic is a member of the onion family, along with leeks and shallots and chives. And of course, we can't mention garlic without talking about vampires. Uh, Central Europeans thought so highly of garlic's powers that wearing it around your neck or hanging it in your window would ward off vampires, demons, and werewolves. And of course, if they don't like the smell, it will keep the neighbors away as well. A large number of farms were once part of the urban landscape in Lexington, Massachusetts. But things changed as the population grew and farmers were forced to sell their land to make room for housing and development. That meant increased pressure on those farmers left behind. Jason Schultz introduces us to one farm family looking to serve their community and keep their farm alive. If these shoppers are like many Americans these days and want to know where their food comes from, boy, are they in luck. 
the customers of the Wilson Farm Store can just look out from the parking lot. Squash being picked this morning will be in the store within a matter of hours. Why is it that you come here? You know, you can go to the grocery store and pick it up along with your other items. Why, why come to this market here? It, it's, a, it's a very enjoyable experience and um, um, they have great stuff, great prices. I mean, there's, it's, I, I come here, you know, um, just, it's, it's just a great place and I, 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 I have a huge smile on my face when I leave this. And I mean, it changes every season. As you can see right now, it's very summer-like. summer, summer -like. Mm -hmm. And by the time you get to the fall, the color changes. They have all the pumpkins out. Wilson Farm is located in Lexington, Massachusetts, the historic town just 10 miles west of Boston. We built the, retail, the first retail store in 1954, the year I was born. And um, it's really the reason we've been able to survive in this location. As this community grew over the decades, acres and acres of prime farmland were gradually transformed into houses. That's the last crop you grow. The Wilsons have been able to maintain and grow their farming operation because of a decision to sell their goods at their retail market instead of wholesale. Besides their 28 acres in Lexington, the family also grows 600 acres of produce in nearby New Hampshire. You know, you got an interesting perspective because you've seen over the years your neighbors that farm close up shop, right? Yeah. There, in Lexington, when I was in high school, was nothing but farms. There were probably 60 working farms, mid-size, a few big ones, but mostly mid to small. This is the only one left. When you had neighbors, all farmers, it, thought, it was thought of as an agricultural community. Is it safe to say that for a farm like yours, because you're surrounded by non-farmers now, you really have to have direct engagement with the people in the community? In some respects, you kind of have to educate your neighbors on what you're doing here. Oh, absolutely. And it's, we've, we've, I've, done, I've done a walking farm tours for adults for 20 years on the farm to try to, peep, to, try to bring this thing forward. But it's also, I mean, the advantage to uh, non-farming neighbors is that they're all, they're all potential customers, too. And uh, so, you know, you've, you've got, everything's, everything's got a plus and a minus. And bringing it forward for the Wilsons has meant transforming the roadside stand into a grocery destination, all run by the Wilson family. You got choices where you can shop, obviously, and go to the grocery store. What brings you back here? Because everything's fresh. Besides an expanding store, the Wilsons are taking advantage of the renewed interest in locally grown food, giving residents here a chance to commit to purchasing throughout the season with a community supported agriculture program. It guarantees folks fresh produce every week. When I was little, it was, it was, it, yeah, I would, I lived a few houses away and I'd cry, I'd come down. And, you know, my, my family was, all, my grandfather, my father, my mother were all working at the farm every day. And I would come down the hill. I was too young to cross the street by myself. So I'd have to yell, one of the cashiers would come out, cross me so I could go to work. I always knew I'd end up here. Let's give you some sweet facts about Massachusetts. Do you like donuts? The Dunkin' Donut chain got its start with its first store in Quincy, Massachusetts in 1950. And the state has an official state dessert. It's the Boston cream pie, of course. Now we've taken you to New York, New Mexico, and Massachusetts, where the urban farm experience is all out of doors. So how about an urban farm crop that's just a bit different and might well be perfect for growing in the heart of a city? Well, Rob Stewart takes us to meet a woman in Sacramento who's farming in a pretty unique place. This is the heart of the capital of California, downtown Sacramento. It is a bustling city, home to a half million people. This is one of the city's industrial parks, street after street, lined with warehouses. And we found something inside this building on B Street that just might catch you by surprise. When we pulled up here and I saw this warehouse, I said, no way, this can't be a mushroom farm. <laughs> urban a, farming. It is urban farming. We're just a mile from the state capitol building of California. 
Meet Roxana Walker, a mushroom maven who turned this ordinary warehouse into an 8,000 square foot farm. Mushrooms are a unique product that uh, they don't require sunlight, so they don't need to be outdoors. In fact, you have to protect them from too much sunlight. And uh, a warehouse is ideal because you can control humidity, you can control how much light they get, how much fresh air they get. So it's kind of a, it's a perfect urban farm. There is a science to every method of farming, especially mushrooms. Roxana turned this warehouse into a microclimate to cultivate her creations. Misters keep the humidity level high, between 65 and 70 percent. And each of these bags contains the materials to spawn and grow her mushroom crop. They just pop right up out of here? Yes, it's sort of like the phenomenon of your mushrooms in your yard. And so how long will this continue to fruit? Uh, this is the third fruiting for this particular set of uh, baskets. And, and basically, they continue to fruit until they have used up uh, the water in the bags. Every Saturday, Roxana's crew makes the mushroom bags from scratch. They start with recycled sawdust, wetting it down, and pumping it into these individual bags. Then the bags are cooked, sterilizing them with steam. Each bag is then capped with cotton, then seeded with mycelium, called spawn. Roxana says it's a Chinese method of mushroom cultivation. What are these white clumps in there? That's the actual plant. That's the mycelium. And same with the brown. They, they give off this, this waste product, basically, that browns up the bag. So the plant is this, and this is its fruiting body. All of this began as a hobby for Roxana. In 2000, Roxana, a chemist by trade, started growing mushrooms in her home to sell at a local farmer's market. They look gorgeous. I mean, look at this, this is the blue. And it's just velvety and huge. These are my favorites. Roxana quickly outgrew her home mushroom farm and in 2010 took a leap of faith, transforming her hobby into a career growing more than a thousand pounds of mushrooms a week. Every day at 5 a.m., Roxana combs each aisle, gently harvesting her crop. This box of mushrooms you say just picked a couple of hours ago? Yes, this morning. And we are setting up for our, uh, our farmer's markets tomorrow. So, tomorrow. Yes, everything's going out. So this is a pretty quick turnaround from crop, or in this case warehouse, to the farmer's market, yep. to someone's plate. Absolutely. You like those? Yeah. And then on the very end, everything we grow is in a combination pack. This is the brown oyster and this is the golden oyster. We're making a beef shiitake onion soup. Roxana loves to meet her customers, selling her mushrooms at farmer's markets all across Northern California and delivering to gourmet chefs at regional restaurants. Okay, so this is the king oyster and it's dense and meaty. It's an excellent substitution for meat. We've got shiitake, kind of a smoky, woodsy flavor. The most medicinal mushroom we've got on the table. Um, beech, we've got white beech and brown beech, kind of a nutty little crisp mushroom. And this guy is our fantastic showboat for the summer. It loves heat, golden oyster, and its cousin, the brown oyster. This, of course, is our best seller here. We move massive amounts of oyster here at this market. Roxana also teaches her customers how to grow their own mushrooms with kits she creates at the warehouse. Good, so good, it's so exciting. Oh, I'm glad you're having a good time with it. It's fun. It's a full circle moment for the happy mushroom farmer, from hobby to career to teacher of the trade. Being in a warehouse satisfies my intellect that I can grow these, but my heart is completely satisfied by being here seeing people enjoy my mushrooms, coming back week after week and buying my mushrooms. I love it. I love it. One interesting note about mushrooms. Today, of course, we use mushrooms as a popular food item. But did you know that for centuries, mushrooms were also used as a natural dye for clothing? Have you logged on to our America's Heartland website? It's americasheartland.org. We have video from all of our shows and a lot more on different aspects of agriculture. And find us as well through some of your favorite social media sites. 
That's going to do it for us this time. Thank you for coming along. We'll see you next time on America's Heartland. You can purchase a DVD or Blu-ray copy of this program. Here's the cost. To order, just visit us online or call 888-814-3923. You can see it in the eyes of every woman and man In America's heartland Living close to the land There's a love for the country And a pride in the brand In America's heartland Living close Close to the land America's Heartland is made possible by CropLife America, representing the companies whose modern farming innovations help America's farmers provide nutritious food for communities around the globe. The Fund for Agriculture Education, a fund created by KVIE to support America's Heartland programming. Contributors include the following.